Never mind, I did it right. Okay, so week five. It's just amazing how we've gone through our first exam already. We're on week five. You know, we're almost over the hill, almost on hump Wednesday, if you want to call that hump day, in the middle of semester. Um, it's going to go by quick from now on. Uh, a lot of work due for all your courses. You know, just keep yourself organized. Um, those who did 78 or less on exam, please try to make an appointment with me. And if you make an appointment, try to make it, because I'm sitting here on Zoom waiting for you, to try to help you understand those concepts that weren't missed, okay? And I am available for you. We are going to do cardiac and respiratory this week. They're pretty heavy. So you're going to have to really pay attention to the lecture this week on the PowerPoints because I will take us off the PowerPoint, put us on whiteboard, draw pictures for you, and try to describe cardiac congenital defects like a hose being kinked. And where does the blood go when it's kinked? And we know if it was a hose, it goes backwards, right? And there's always an empty in spot for it. So if we can think of that as we get to cardiac, you'll be good. Respiratory is similar to your adults, but of course there's differences in the assessments. How do infants and children look as compared to an adult when they're sick, okay? You have your quiz that's due. Um, I'm gonna be going over all the stuff that's on the quiz um, in lecture. And uh, you also have a discussion question due for this week. So if you have a chance. So let's go ahead, start with our PowerPoint first. So I start with respiratory, and then I'm going to go into the cardiac. So respiratory, there are usually in children, we have upper respiratory infections. It doesn't go into the lower ones. Yes, there's some pneumonias, but mostly it's the mucus and the mucus and ear infections and just, you know, the nasal cavities full of mucus and coughing. Most upper respiratory infections are a virus. That's why you take your children to the doctor, you got 104 fever and a cough and mucus, and you go, oh my God, we need antibiotics. Well, I'll actually tell you, higher fevers are usually viruses. It's that fever 101, 102 that usually is bacterial. And that's not written in any book. That's just my experiences to let you know, you, of those of you who are our parents, so that's why they'll say, Tylenol, Motrin, give liquids, and you're like, oh, we didn't do nothing. Well, after three, four days, if you're still sick, go back, and then they'll order your um, antibiotics just in case. And at that point, if the condition is worse, they'll probably do a chest x-ray to make sure it's not pneumonia, especially if you can't hear it yet. Now, one of the viruses that um, infants is the worst um, developmental level that we could, are concerned about is RSV. Now RSV for me and you is a cold. For older children, it's a cold, it's upper respiratory infection. But children, infants, the young ones, especially zero to six months, they're having a hard time sucking, swallowing and breathing. It means just, you know, bottle or breast and breathing at the same time. That's a big chore for them. Now put on it mucus in these, you know, in their nose and in the back of their throat, how are they gonna breathe and suck? So that's why these children, you're gonna see them not eating as well um, because of all the mucus. Now, if you're a cardiac child or you have some immunosuppressive disease or you're premature or have some pulmonary problems because of that, having RSV is going to put a lot of stress on that child. So in this case, for these children, you know, compromised children who have conditions that you don't want this extra mucus, there is a vaccine, a monthly vaccine given usually September to early spring, so fall and spring. Um, they give it monthly to prevent these children from getting RSV, and it is called a Synergist. It's one of those things on your matching form that you do need to know. Synergist, you will see it again. Um, and it does work. It is a um, vaccination. It's like getting a flu shot every month, sort of. Um, and it does help prevent it. Now, of course, you can have bacterial infections. But as I said, we wouldn't even consider any sort of bacterial infection until the child's been sick three or four days. Now, 
one of the things to understand about children is how do they get sick? When do they get sick? Why do they get sick? Especially the little ones, especially the children who are below one years old. Now, when the mother, when the mother um, has a child, those maternal antibodies are given to the baby. And it's good for about the first three months. And then they start to go away, they dissipate, especially if a child is not having any sort of little upper respiratories or infections at all. We don't want them to get at that point because literally they don't have an immune system yet. They have moms, but it's really not enough to fight well enough. It's why we give these immunizations at two, four, six months. We wanna load up those children, those infants to be protected from those really bad infections, you know, um, we don't want these children to be getting things like your um, uh, whooping cough, uh, pertussis and um, that. So, because it's a very hard to uh, take care of. So that's why we uh, give those immunizations a lot. Now, between three to six months, mom's antibodies are almost going away. That's when you start seeing the infant getting sick. That's when you start seeing them, oh, they've got an you know, upper respiratory infections. By the time they're in toddler preschooler, I've told you it's the age of swapping spit, especially if they're in daycare around other children. They swap toys. What are they doing? They're putting it in their mouth. That is part of self-soothing, that chewing and biting and exploration in the mouth is just what they do. So they're going to be spreading infections. And yes, we don't want that, but sort of we do. Because once they get an infection, a viral infection, what does the body do? it builds up antibodies. So now they're gonna be protected against the next infection. By the time they're in school, this is when you start getting more of the bacterial infections, your mycoplasma or your strep. It's usually not your virals anymore. It's more of the, because your body has built up the immune system to it. And we know as we get sick and we build up our immune system, we're going to have a better immune system as we get older. Now children, they're getting a lot of ear infections. It's one of the biggest complaints, you know, the kid comes in and their ear hurts. And I love the way they take the right hand to show the left ear and the left hand to show the right ear. And, you know, it just hurts me because they're telling me these little two-year-olds, you know, it hurts. But what it's, why does that happen? Well, the airways are small, so mucus don't go down. So, and they're, everything's really close together. So the mucus goes up into their ears and they don't blow their nose well either. So it sits there and it, where does it go? Least resistance up into the ears. And that's why they get a lot of um, ear infections. Now, what does a child look like when they're sick? Well, you and me as adults, we still carry on daily life because we have to. We still, with a fever, we'll take Tylenol, we'll keep going, especially if you're in clinicals, you're not going to miss them. You're going to get there because you don't want to make them up because you don't have time for them. And child, they'll stop. These children with fever will get on the couch, sit there and go to sleep at 10 o'clock in the morning. You're like, what is going on? or they'll stop eating. Stop eating, maybe vomit once, but it could be just a little fever, stop eating. That's telling you, this child is getting sick. Something is going on. Adults will keep eating, will keep going, but children don't. And that's what's so special about them. You might see them with the fever. They're not eating. They might have a cough or complaining their throat hurts. They might vomit once. And remember those breath sounds, listen to the lungs because we have those bronchial sounds, that upper respiratory, they always have mucus. Younger children have a hard time clearing it. They can't blow the nose like adults do. So our goal for taking care of children when they're sick, if they're not breathing well, we wanna help them eliminate that mucus. You know, maybe it is suctioning that infant out, getting the mucus out, letting them breathe before they have their feeds to help. When you do that, it helps them eat, they're comfortable, they go to sleep and they're resting and that helps them feel better. Trying to uh, prevent the spread of infection, of course, you know, these children are taught at an early age to put their face into their, to their elbow. You know, my little grandson who just turned five, he's been sticking his hand there since he started daycare. And I just thought it was so cute that they teach it so quickly, but it's understandable. Once you take a child with a fever 
and medicate them with the appropriate dose of Tylenol or Motrin, acetaminophen or ibuprofen, their fever comes down, what happens? They're like, they're not even sick. They're up, running around, eating and drinking and playing. As soon as that fever comes back, what happens? They lay back down and you know their fevers come back up. So keeping the fever down promotes hydration and nutrition. And you know, children, just like us adults, especially our husbands, they want those big hugs and kisses when they don't feel well. And they want to be told that, you know, you'll take care of them. As I said- Professor, yes. I, I have a question. It's not, it's related, but not related to this. Sure. Uh, which, which is, what is the formula for um, um, Tylenol and Maltrin for kids, like for infants? Okay. And Okay, you only give Tylenol up to the age of six months, no ibuprofen until after six months. And at Nicholas Children's, we give 15 milligrams per kilogram per dose. Okay, Motrin, ibuprofen is 10 milligrams per kilogram per dose. And if you're over six months old, you can alternate them every three hours. So Tylenol at 12, Motrin at six, Tylenol at six, Motrin at nine, around the clock to keep their fevers down so they feel good. Because why do we medicate for fever? Because they hurt, they feel terrible. And we want them to eat or drink, okay? Does that help you, Maribel? Do you need help you know, making yes, your thank child's you. dosages? I can help you, not a problem, I, I totally get it. Now. Ear infections are that mucus, as I said, those little short, wide open eustachian tubes, mucus collects in there and it hurts and it causes bulging of the middle ear. And that's what the pain is, that, that fluid that's collecting. If they are having, children are having more frequent infections in the ears, four or five a year, they're gonna say, all right, you're gonna to need to put tubes in there. And the tubes literally just let the fluid drain out and you'll see it coming out the ear uh, instead of it building up in your side your ear. As a nurse, you get a child, you know they have an ear infection. Promise me you'll remember to give them Tylenol or Motrin if it's due, it hurts. I preferred the ibuprofen because there's like a little anti-inflammatory in it. Uh, so I always like that one with um, ears, but this isn't written anywhere. This is you as parents and as future nurses, if you work pediatrics, it is a better choice. Our goal is not to have them with ear infections. So if we need to, we'd do surgery. Um, treatment for ear infections include Tylenol Motrin for pain and fever, increase the fluids, and we're gonna give an antibiotic. This is a bacterial infection. Usually something as simple as a moxil works on these children. So infectious mononucleosis. Um, it's also known as you heard of the, the kissing disease. Um, it's shared by sharing cups and, and saliva and mucus. And that's why they say it's kissing disease. It is a virus. It's a herpes-like Epstein-Barr virus. Now, infectious mononucleosis is, let me tell you a case history so you'll understand the progression of it. Child comes in complaining of aches and pain, fever, sore throat. Normal, say, okay, must be strep throat. What they'll do is they'll do a swab, strep is negative. They'll do a flu test too, just to be sure. It's gonna be negative, they say it's viral. Tylenol and Motrin increase fluids. Three days, four days later, they're still with a fever, still feeling horrible, throat still hurts. They go back to the doctor or they'll go to urgent care or the ER or whatever. We'll say, all right, well, you've already been fighting with it just in case. Everything's still negative because they'll test it again, but they'll put on antibiotics. Now, seven to 10 days later is usually when they say, I I'm going to the ER. I I you know, my doctor's not doing what they're supposed to. This kid still hurts. It's not working. It's the wrong antibiotic. You know, the antibiotics is giving him vomiting, you know, now the throat hurts. And they say, okay, you've been going through this for a week, 10 days. Let me do some blood work and we'll do a CBC to look for the white count, see if it's bacteria, right? Because an elevated white count shows bacteria, it doesn't show virus. Then we're gonna do something called a monospot test. And more than likely with all those symptoms, you're gonna see it positive. Now, the biggest concern in mononucleosis is that the spleen or liver or both swell they get swollen. Now, the spleen is like a big balloon. If it gets pressure on it too much, it will burst. And if it bursts, 
the child will die. Now, true, real story. Nine-year-old boy came on a Saturday because I worked only weekends. I was one of those bailer shift kids. And on Saturday, came in with the father. The doctor was good, explained everything. I reinforced no PE, no rough housing, protect that belly, follow up with your physician in three weeks to get the release, to go back to sports, blah, blah, blah. One week later, this kid was air rescued in. He was out in the Everglades on a three-wheeler, fell off under his belly, spleen broke, and he died. I cried my butt off. I did nothing wrong. I told this parent, I told the child. And it's just something that I share with you to let you know that infectious mononucleosis, kissing disease, can be a big deal. So it, please explain, even if they're adolescents, protect your belly, no rough housing, don't let anybody touch your belly, no PE, no, you can't play softball, football, no, you need to rest until the other doctor clears you. I don't care if it's a championship, we need to protect your life, okay? I think you understand that well. <laughs> so croup, croup is that barking cough so distinct, distinguished that you can hear children across the room, down the hall, coming into triage, you hear, oh, we have a croup, can you hear it? And it's various degrees. So it starts out with that inspiratory, inspiratory strider and that barking cough, okay? It is the swelling of the larynx, the trachea, the bronchus. Now, is it as it progresses, it can go into something called epiglottitis. Now, epiglottitis is that leaf-like structure that covers your trachea when you swallow, right? So food doesn't go in your lungs. So no aspiration pneumonia because your body takes care of it because both those tubes are in the back of your throat. Now that epiglottis gets swollen, which means it's covering the trachea, which means is air coming in and out? Barely. These children, you'll see them bent over tripod and you'll see them drooling, they can't swallow. And you're gonna hear that <gasps> trying to get a breath into them. These children never, ever look into their mouth. You don't wanna do anything to cause more swelling in the back of their mouth. The person who's gonna look will be able to either intubate, which probably is not gonna happen because the epiglottis is covering that trachea. Usually it'll be a tracheostomy. I've never seen it get that far, but it can depending on how long the parent waits. So we need to prevent that swelling from continuing. Now, how do you decrease swelling? Well, what we do is we will give them a racemic epi aerosol and the epi goes directly into the epiglottis and helps the swelling. Many times we will give a shot of epinephrine too, you know, depending on the physician, start an IV because these children that can't eat or drink now, they can't even breathe. We're not gonna give anything. Any person who can't breathe is not going to eat, period. They're NPO. They need to take care of airway first. Forget about you're thirsty. I don't care. You're going to breathe first, okay? We might, we'll start an IV, give IV fluids, and we'll probably give some, some sort of steroids. And that steroids is going to help decrease that swelling. And it usually, usually will work. Now, acute laryngotracheal bronchitis, another word for croup, is usually those younger children less than school age and it's most of the time again is a virus so how do we treat croup well it's a swelling it's going to be this child's going to get some sort of steroid and the steroid's going to again decrease the swelling that's going on it could be one shot it could be um oral Presence alone, given two, three, four days, twice a day, once a day, all depending on physicians, but it will be include some sort of steroids. Now, usually when you have croup, it's you've already had a cold. So you already have some irritation going on there and there's swelling left and you're gonna hear the child breathing in. You're gonna hear that little bit going on. Um, you're gonna see them start to retract. You're gonna see those barking things going on. And if this is not treated, that swelling don't go away, the irritation continues, it swells more, it's gonna to go to respiratory acidosis and failure. This child can, with simple croup, can become hypoxic and could code on you very, very easily if uh, they finally get to the emergency room. So maintain the airway, how do we do that? 
Hydration is either IV or orally. I told you we're not oraling anybody who can't breathe. A croup is talking to you, but it's barking, okay. But epiglottitis, absolutely not. And a child who's showing signs and symptoms of respiratory distress, we will not. What does a child look like with respiratory distress? Well, you'll see a child in between their clavicles right here. This point, and it's only in children, you'll see it retracting. We call it retracting to the backbone. It goes really in. It's part of the retractions. Abdominal breathing, intercostal retractions. Infants, you'll see nasal flaring. And after each breath, there's a grunt. It's like they're flaring and eh, eh, eh. You see an infant who's grunting, I will bring that kid to the trauma room immediately, that kid's close to respiratory collapse. That is one of the cardinal signs of severe respiratory distress, grunting and nasal flaring, of course, along with all the retractions and everything. So croup, what do we do? Um, epiglottitis, we're still gonna put on a moisturized mist with a little bit of oxygen so they breathe a little bit easier. And again, getting the epinephrine and getting those steroids and it does help. RSV, the other word for it is called bronchiolitis. There are synonymous, not bronchitis, bronchiolitis, okay? As I said, it's spring, uh, fall to spring. And uh, for the young infants, um, those with some sort of condition up to one year old, we are gonna be giving the synergist injection, uh, immunization once a month, and that helps. And our goal with RSV is to get the airway cleared. Maybe um, those little suction devices you can get, the Frida things that they're called, you suction their nose out before they eat. Um, and maybe if they're sleeping and they're, they can't breathe, definitely then. Um, but remember, you can't overdo suctioning because it promotes more secretion. So there's a fine line there. But as long as they can eat, swallow and breathe, uh, we got rid of it, then these older children actually do very well. Again, it's a virus, Tylenol and Motrin for comfort and fluids to help those secretions maintain thin. Pneumonias are in the lower lobes. It could be lower, middle, upper lobe. Usually I've seen mostly lower lobe things, but they can be anywhere or it could be multiple pneumonias and multiple lobes. What are you going to see with pneumonia? These children usually are fever, stop eating, and maybe vomit once mucus. And that's all you see. Usually the fevers, are that 101 to 102, like I've told you, it's not in the textbook, I'm just telling you what I've seen. 101 to 102, and if you listen to the breath sounds, all of the five lobes of the lungs, you will hear decreased over that lobe that has pneumonia. So I will tell the child, you're gonna go get a picture, we're gonna look at the inside, and I'm gonna be able to see your lungs. And when I get that picture, I'm gonna show you where that is so that they understand. And I'm telling you, when they understand, they're gonna take their medicines better because they understand that white stuff shouldn't be there. It should be all black, like all the other areas in the lungs. It really helps doing this to children. It takes an extra minute of time and it really helps parents in the long run. Causes of pneumonia mostly are bacterial. Usually you're on pneumonia, they're gonna be giving you antibiotics. Uh, there are some more complicated case, mycoplasma. And thank goodness today we have a pneumococcal vaccine because that's probably one of those um, more serious, harder to treat um, pneumonias. That usually ends up, especially younger children, end up in the hospital because they're very sick. Now, I mentioned pertussis before. It is one of our immunizations, the two, four, six month immunizations, but pertussis was wiped out but there's still cases of it. A couple of years back, we had some here in South Florida. Why? Well, there are children who are not immunized. Parents do not believe in immunizations, which is their right. But what they're doing is um, subjecting people who are immunized to the disease. And just because you're immunized doesn't always mean you're not gonna get it. Just like the flu, you got the flu shot. Does it mean you're not gonna get the flu? No. It might be a milder case though, which is what we immunize for. So pertussis, extremely, extremely contagious. These children end up very sick. 
These kids end up in the hospital. We're supporting their respiratory system. They're placed in isolation where their room air is recirculated. It can't go out into the air within the hospital because it will sped, spread respiratory. So a respiratory isolation with a reverse laminar flow room, it's called. And these children um, usually are sent into the ICU. They're so sick, especially the young ones. Another thing children love to do is to put things in their mouth and they inhale and they start to go down the throat. Now, one of the most popular things is a coin. You know, I wish it was the penny. I'm telling you, most of the time, it's a quarter. Can you imagine the big quarter going down a three and four year old child? Now, it hurts in the esophagus. Usually it doesn't get in the trachea, thank God because that epiglottis protects it with swallowing. So usually, but it hurts. Now they can't swallow because it's obstructed and because it hurts. And that's when they usually tell mom, I swallowed something. I swallowed a lollipop once that was big and round. So it's very similar, but I got it down before I went to the emergency room. I remember they had me by my feet trying to pump it out before they knew Heimlich maneuver way back when, uh, but I was able to spit it out. But how do we take this out today? Now, years ago, when I started nursing, you had a foreign body aspiration. They went into the OR, they put you out under anesthesia, took a bronchoscopy with little claws and pulled it out. Well, we don't need to do that. All we need to do is to take a Foley catheter with a balloon on the end, put it down the mouth below where the coin is, blow up the balloon and lean them forward on the surgeon's lap usually and pull it out and they vomit and the coin goes to the floor. To break tension, do you know what I do? I say, oh, it's a quarter, I see it, it's mine. And the kid drops to the floor and says, no, it's mine, I want it. And, and it makes the situation, they forget what they had just gone through. So they can be removed easily, but it is a frightful situation. You know, there are all things that they swallow. I've seen, um, earrings, uh, backs of earrings, um, all sorts of little toys and beads, uh, hair beads that they have go down up the nose, in the ear, in the mouth, everywhere. I've seen um, a foreign body aspiration of a French fry of a three-year-old boy. He was out you know, at the country club with his parents or grandparents, whatever it was, and is eating a little French fry and he inhaled it. Rescue was called, it came to us, we couldn't get it out either. And he ended up being on ECMO, which is a machine that breathes for him. And three days later, he died, we couldn't get it out. So foreign body aspiration can be a big deal. So if we have it, what are we monitoring? Airway, 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 airway. And the best thing is to keep the child calm. Uh, a lot of times these younger children, I'll keep them in the parent's lap starting IVs, doing procedures, it keeps them calm. Where is a child happy? In mommy or daddy's lap, right? They don't wanna be in my lap, doctor's lap. They wanna be with the person they know. And it does help, I'm telling you, it really does help. So after the foreign body aspiration, we get it out. You know, they've had that X-ray, we show them what it looks like so they understand. Uh, afterwards, we're gonna monitor this child for a little while. Um, and we're gonna monitor airway on an O2 sat monitor, make sure there's no swelling going on there. There's another way that we can aspirate stuff into the lungs, actually two ways, Johnson & Johnson baby powder, my most best smelling stuff, I love the things, and I wish I could put it on every baby, but the powder in the air, they have found that that powder can hurt the lung. So I couldn't use any on my grandson, I was so upset, but oh well, my kids had it. Now. Another way that you can have aspiration pneumonia is feeding. Reflux, children have reflux. It's just part of some children's life. Their food goes up and down. We need to do things to prevent aspiration. One of the things we do is we put a little bit of rice cereal in their formula or breast milk if we can. Now you're gonna say a newborn with food, they're not gonna utilize the food. It's to thicken the cereal. You're gonna see the cereal in the stool they don't digest it because of that immature GI tract, but it helps thicken the food, keep it down. Teaching parents how to burp children, not to overfeed children. Having them sitting up after fe um, feed can help prevent that aspiration pneumonia. And of course, when you're using really bad 
cleaning materials, keep the kid out of the bathroom when you have bleach in the tub or the shower, because you know, if you inhale, it hurts. Children's lungs are a little bit more tender. Now, acute respiratory distress syndrome is an injury and acute injury to the lung. It could be due to many things. <clears throat> the one thing I'm gonna mention is, uh, especially because I live in South Florida and I know you all live around water somewhere, drowning is a big deal. Many times um, we'll get calls, kid found the bottom of the pool. Um, they, by the time rescue came, they were already up running around, but they're bringing the kid in. Well, thank goodness they do because that injury to the lung sometimes doesn't happen instantly. It could be up to 72 hours later. These children will be watched in a monitored situation, usually a step down ICU with SAP monitor for up to 72 hours to make sure they're not gonna go into ARDS because ARDS is a child who's paralyzed, sedated, ventilated, and we can barely get oxygen and remove carbon dioxide from them. It is extremely, extremely sick child. It could be due to an overwhelming infection. In fact, infection is the biggest reason for it. But um, I do mention the drowning because it's an injury. Could be due to a trauma, car accident, you know, chest tubes, et cetera, can cause it. Um, adolescence, drug overdosing, and then of course the drowning. So as I said, how do we treat ARDS? We're gonna total knock the child out, try to breathe for them, you know, and try to work on good pulmonary toileting and letting those lungs try to work. But as you can see, mortality rates are very high. They die a lot from this. And these children are usually a one nurse to one patient uh, scenario. They are that sick. Common of all this, uh, respiratory illnesses in children is asthma. And asthma is a hyper-responsive airway, usually due to some sort of allergen. Uh, whether it's a cat, the dog, grass, it could be, you know, your, um, your beds need cover on them. There's too many rugs, uh, curtains, could be all these things that can cause it. And it causes the lungs to get tickled. They say, I don't like this stuff, gets inflamed, airways narrow, and they can't breathe. And what we see is coughing, 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 coughing. And you will hear that the, there are with this very pronounced expiratory phase. So they get the air in, but it gets stuck. So if you listen to a chest of a child with asthma, you're gonna hear wheezing. And if it's really bad, you might just hear a little in the bottom of one lung. And I'm serious, uh, sometimes is all you hear because they cannot move air at all. So how do we treat and how do we manage asthma? Well. You get a child coming in, having an asthma attack. The parent tells you, I gave four puffs of that albuterol because of that your rescue inhaler and it didn't work. My next question is, how did you give that albuterol? Was it an aerosol with a mask? Was it the MDI, you know, the little puffer? And if it was the puffer, did you use a spacer? Now, what is a spacer? You see the orange, pink and blue thing on the bottom? You put the mask to the face, the other side does the, the uh, MDI, uh, little puffer, you, one or two puffs, whatever their dose is, let them breathe in and out four or five times, they got their dose. You can do puff and if you don't breathe in, it's gone. Many adults can't do that. It's like chewing gum and walking. Some people can't do that, but this puffer, we need to make sure that medicine goes in. This can actually save children from going and being admitted because it was just an inappropriate use of the medicine. Now, once we've decided that this child has asthma and they usually won't make this diagnosis till about two years old, um, it has to be more things going on, more uh, asthma type upper respiratory things. We'll be doing uh, things to measure their pulmonary function. How well are they breathing in and out? How much volume that they do? They send them home today once diagnosed with an end, um, a peak end expiratory meter. And there's this little thing that they blow in and then suck in really hard. And we could see how much air volume they move. When they're well, we do that. So that's our baseline. If we see our child starting with a cough, we see in them with stuffy nose, we can repeat that 
And if those numbers are going down, the volume isn't moving as well, well, then we can immediately increase the amount of aerosols we give this child. So now we can prevent. That's our big thing, prevent. Because sometimes if we don't permit, prevent, these children could go into status asthmaticus. And status asthmaticus is not fun. My husband did it for 12 days in the ICU and he was this close to intubation, but thank God they let me stay with him and I could talk him down every time. But it was difficult to know that he had a, and that was all the noise in one of the lungs. It was barely, barely moving. So that's our prevention. And with kids, we want them to be normal. We want kids to be kids. So if we can manage them and, and keep preventing them, that's what we want. <clears throat> We'll be having them on aerosols, you know, in the adult world, we have Simbacor, Brio. These are those little atrovent. <clears throat> These are those twice a day things and they're preventative. They're not for those acute rescue moments. That's only your um, albuterol, albuterol prevental, whatever your name that you know. Um, that's only for rescue, but these are preventative. Also, we're gonna be giving that singular at night and it's like a Claritin, but specific to the lungs. So prevents the, al the allergens attacking the lungs that they breathe better. And if we're seeing they're continuing, they're not doing well, then we're gonna be saying, uh, all right, we need to go to the doctor. We need to get some sort of steroids. You know, adults, they do medrol dose packs. Children do prednisolone differently. And in children, the twice a day medicines, what they usually use is Pulmacort. Uh, and it's a medicine they use to help prevent asthma. So there's more with asthma. There's more with these children. I have it more on the cahoots. Even cystic fibrosis is on the cahoots. So um, let's go into the heart now. So cardiac defects are either congenital, they're born with them, or they acquire them as they get older. Usually it is due to a viral infection, infection that causes things like that big stretched heart, cardiomyopathy. Um, it could be an autoimmune. What does lupus attack? It attacks hearts. So it could attack that. It could be due to the environment around them or it could be something that came hereditary through the family. Now, if you do not know the way a blood goes around the heart, you need to study it you need to refresh yourself. We know that the blood is forced out of that left atrium. So that's the high pressure side, it goes around the body and then it just comes in through the vena cavas, inferior and superior back into the right atrium. The valves between those septums you need to know between the right atrium and right ventricle is the tricuspid valve. It goes up through the pulmonary valve into the lungs. It comes down to the left atrium. There's actually four pulmonary veins. I always thought there was one until the surgeons told me there's four. I said, I never knew that. Into the left atrium, through the mitral valve, into the left ventricle, which is your pump, your engine, up the aorta, and then it will go all through the aortic arch and down into the body. Now, here's your hose. Think about a hose. Think about backward um, backward pressure because things can't go forward. Let me go to a whiteboard now. I'm gonna show you something. <clears throat> All right, we have lungs. Wait, where are you? Nope, it's not what I want. How do I do this clear? Hold on, I'm getting there. I said I don't want you. Sorry, guys. Hold on.
I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. Select, take it, that one. All right, we're gonna to have to do it looking at a picture. I will tell you that the other classes, when you go to um, the YouTube video, I take out the whiteboard and I, and I show it to you. I'm gonna to have to figure that out. I don't wanna waste your time. All right, let's look at the aorta. So we have the aorta. This is the hose coming off the heart, right? And we see that arrow going down uh, right above the liver. What if there was a kink in there? What if it wasn't as open as wide? Blood can't get down there well, can it? So you will see no blood going down. It's going to end up, their pulses in the feet, their salus pedis and the posterior tibial, those pulses are going to be very weak, right? Now, what's the blood pressure going to look like? It's going to be low because there's no blood going down. Now, because it's kinked, the blood has to go somewhere backwards, right? So if you go backwards, you see those three openings up top, those go to the head. An older child, when they can talk to you and complain, might have headaches because of the extra flow going up there because it's not going down. Also, they might have nosebleeds. That's one of the common things that happen with older children. Now, still not enough room, it's gonna go back down into the heart and it's gonna go up into the lungs and it's gonna fill up in congestive failure, especially the younger children. Many of these things, and this is called a coarctation of the aorta, kink in the hose, backwards failure, and then the lungs fill up with fluid. These children go undiagnosed for a while. You'll see a child who's tachypnic, tachycardic, failure to thrive, tires easily, can't eat well, and they can't determine what's going on. They could have minimal pulses in the lower extremity, so that throws them off, but it's still a coarctation that's going on. I had a little three-year-old girl, that a infant that I took care of, that all of these things happen. And at three months old is when they said, you know, we think it's cardiac, send them to our hospital. And then of course we did an echocardiogram and we found it and were helped to bring this child back to where she needed to be. But she had already had, you know, her left ventricle was stretched because of the fluid going. She had her lungs full and it took a while to get her back. So if I have a kink, you know, and don't have a valve opening, we know it's gonna be backwards. Blood flows one direction, but if it can't go, some of it's gonna come back. So what are you gonna see? Exactly what I just told you. These are those children who are not diagnosed and many children get by. Today, we are in and out of the hospital what, in a day or two with a newborn. And, you know, we not, may not be able to see it yet. So. When you see a kid who's this infant is not eating well because they tire really easily, they're tachypnic tachycardic more than they should be. Heart rates are 180 instead of 140 to 160. Their respiratory rates are 70, not 40 to 60. So something's going on. And that's usually where we say, you know, and this is at rest, what's going on, it's happening. Again, that heart is working so hard. Trying to oxygenate the body is burning up calories and they're not eating well, so they're having no weight gain. Very common occurrence in your cardiac children, poor weight gain, and um, they're not gonna be up to where they should be. Three months old on a seven pound child, you know, they should weigh somewhere about 10, 11 pounds. If they're still at eight or nine, something's going on. That's why we learn these markers to look at it. Again, not getting nutrition, developmental delays. They're not gonna be able to voluntary grasp at three months old. And they should just about want to do that at that point. Um, sometimes there's a history of it, sometimes there's not. Um, and it's something that we look for. Now, when we look at this infant, this child, of course, nutritional status is number one. We see a child underweight, working hard, failure to thrive. We're always gonna think cardiac. Um, it'll be the first thing that we always rule out. And then of course, if we see the color, we see a child looking cyanotic like this picture here, we're definitely monitor saturations. 
Then we're going to look at the chest. First look, you know, that inspection, looking around. Um, when we look at the child, we can see that maybe sometime you put your hand on, you feel like a buzzing in the chest. That could be a murmur that's going on in there. And you're going to see the way that they're breathing. You're not going to see clubbing of fingers till later on in life. And, and I have a picture as we go onward. As again, palpation and percussion, you touch the chest now. You're going to feel them pulling, um, breathing fast. You're going to feel that buzzing that something's going on in that heart. And you're going to listen to it and you're going to hear that there is a murmur in there. Another thing is in um, cardiac, if we have a child with a coarctation of the aorta that we see lower extremity, decreased pulses or none, the next thing we're going to do is a four extremity blood pressure. Now, why do we do that? Well, I told you down doesn't get blood, so blood pressures are low. And then I said the blood goes up. So the upper is going to have higher blood pressures. So a four extremity, two arms, two legs is going to show us a difference between the upper and lower blood pressures by at least 20 millimeters of mercury. And that's going to be the sign that says this is most likely a coarctation of the aorta because sometimes you still feel pulses, but the difference in the blood pressure is going to show it to you. Again, we're gonna look at the abdominal breathing, looking for pulses if they have any everywhere. And the heart rate is gonna be a um, thing that we look at. And of course, what are those heart sounds? Do you hear a murmur? What's happening? So on admission on a suspected child with a cardiac, um, we are gonna first put on an EKG, do a 12 lead EKG. The first thing we do is hook up to a monitor seeing how the heart is beating, but then we're gonna be doing a 12 lead EKG. And that 12 lead can show us certain different things. One of the things is ventricular hypertrophy or stretching of a ventricle. Then we're gonna do an echocardiogram. And the echocardiogram is gonna show us if there's a kink, where's the blood flows, how's it flowing, pressures in the heart, et cetera. If we have a positive echocardiogram, prepare that family for a cardiac catheterization. And why are we gonna do a cardiac catheterization? Is because we need to do a further diagnostic workup to find out exactly where these things are going on. And that's diagnostic. Sometimes we do cardiac caths for intervention. Now, um, Nicholas Children's Hospital was the first hospital in the United States that inserted a helix device on a young child. And it was to take care of an ASD through cardiac cath. They closed it. It was like two plates. They put the plate through one and then it opened on this side and now it covered that hole. And then we didn't have to do open heart surgery. So that's interventional. And then there's something called electrophysiology studies, our EP studies as the initial is. And that looks at cardiac dysrhythmias usually we use it for tachydysrhythmias. You know, the right atrium has the SA node, which pacemakers the heart, right? Sometimes that SA node um, doesn't work right or another area in the right atrium says, you know, I'm gonna try to beat, make the heart beat the way I want it to right now. And of course the right atrium is gonna be really, really, really fast. It's not gonna be slow like the SA node. Well, we can go in and find out where that little piece in that right atrium is trying to make trouble and we can zap it with a laser and stop the heart from ha having these tachydysrhythmias. And we could take these children off of these medications that they're on. Now in a cardiac cath, nurses need to know what's going on and what to expect before and after. Well, these children will be put under anesthesia they will be having fluids till about four hours before, um, infants, clear liquids two hours before, and they will be going and being uh, put to sleep for this procedure. They take the right groin and they put in catheters uh, into the artery, into the vein, and they inject dyes and they look at things that are going on. Now, once they're done with the procedure, they make a diagnosis, catheters are removed, and really strong pressure is held on that right femoral groin area until it stops bleeding. Then they put a pressure dressing on it 
to keep it that way. And they might, for older children, put a sandbag on it to keep it maintained. Now, this child is now put back on a stretcher or in the bed and brought to your area. Your first priority, check that dressing. Remember, those vessels are huge and this child can bleed out in minutes. So the first thing before vital signs, before anything, I'm going to look at that dressing. And if it's bleeding, what am I going to do? Well, it, it needs pressure. So if this is where the insertion site was and the heart's up here, a little bit above, I'm going to push. So I can see the site because it's coming this way. I'm going to be pushing it and I'm going to call for help. But the treatment is just to apply pressure there. But of course, you have to notify the, um, the cardiac cath doc or your cardiac do doctor that you know, you're having issues. Now, once you get them into bed, you get them calm, there's no bleeding going on, you're going to check the pulses, do vital signs. Um, if the pulses are decreased, because with those catheters in there, it could cause some decreased pulses, make sure it's documented and it's carried on into report. That leg, that right leg should never be bent, should never be put on pillow. These children are on bed rest 24 hours. You do not want that clot where those catheters were to pop off because this child will bleed out very, very quickly. And we don't want to do that. So you can, these kids can eat, they can drink, not a problem. Slowly, you can elevate the head of their bed, you know, once they're calmed down. Um, even after a while, you can have parents hold some of these young child because that's more comfortable. They just have to keep that right leg straight. They cannot bend it very much so. Do and they brace that? I mean, no. you know, within an infant, how, how do you make them, once they're awake, keep their legs straight and from kicking? And Well, sometimes we'll put a blanket over it. Oh. You know, put a blanket, you know, and usually they're on warmers. We could put a blanket and to hold it down. But not a, like a sandbags are usually five pounds and you're not going to put five pounds on these. And many of them are, you know, seven pound kids, six pound kids. So you're not going to do that. But that's a great question, Kim. Yeah, I would put I would hold it on there with a blanket for sure. And if the parent if I if the child is at a condition where parents can hold it, I will tell them to hold it straight, you know, and they can help me with that, too. Thank you okay. for that. Thanks. No, thank you. Now, blood glucose levels in children. Children can have high and low glucose levels from stress, so you always monitor them. If it's low um, and they can eat, if they're awake, give them some juice, give them something to eat, you know, to take care of it. Sometimes with extra fluids that they're given in cardiac calf, sometimes they're high, so it's just to monitor it. Now, congenital heart disease, there's more of them out there than I would really ever want to know, but there really is a lot of congenital hearts out there. Now, they're not always known before they're born. You know, so some of these parents, you know, after birth, children turn blue and they're, you know, sent out, you know, to another hospital because we don't have birthing at Nicholas Children, we're just peed. So then, you know, you're born at the adult hospital and now your, your child's flown out into, you know, another hospital. So it's very, very upsetting on these parents and, and it's very um, distressing, especially if you had a C-section. Can you imagine? I got to get up, get out. I want to go see my kid. That's your first thought, any parent. So these children are very special. Now, Congenital heart disease is the second cause of death after prematurity. Now, those numbers are getting better, but still it is a major cause of death, okay? The most common is VSD and most common children who do get congenital heart defects are your Downs children. So Downs children are always checked for a problem in their heart or listening. Many of them, they'll just do a routine um, echo on them to be sure, especially if they hear anything at all in their chest. Now, there is two types of congenital heart disease. There is acyanotic, which means you're oxygenated, saturations are normal. And then there's cyanotic, and their saturations are not normal. 
in one condition, uh, whether it's a hypoplastic right or left heart, which means that one of those ventricles not working, it's sticking, it muscle don't work, it's called hypoplastic, means it's just sitting there, um, blood can't flow around, and these children are cyanotic. Your oxygen saturations can be 65 to 75%. And that is normal. And then you're saying, well, why didn't you put oxygen on them? Because it tends to put too much flow into the lungs and now you're washing out the blood and causing severe acidosis. So these children, it's something that we call a QPQS ratio. You don't have to know that, but it has to do with lung to systemic ratio. And these children, you need to keep their O2 sats low because it helps with the best cardiac output for them, okay? So it's normal to see these children um, down to 65%. Usually we like them 70 to 80, but not always. One of the things about the heart is there's sometimes shunting. Well, you've learned in OB that at birth, a newborn is born with a little hole between the right atrium called a patent foramen ovale. It's like an ASD or atrial septal defect. There's a hole there. And there is flow going back and forth, okay? Now, remember I told you the right side of blood just trickles in? And I said the left side has a lot more pressure so where is blood going to flow? It's going to go from the left side, it, from the lungs, it's going to go back into the right side and back into the lungs. So it's going to have more pulmonary blood flow. That is with a patent foramen ovale. It could be with an ASD, atrial septal defect, or ventricular septal defect. It just means that the blood goes from high to low, and left to right is left side, to the right side, okay? And that's usually the way that you'll see shunting going in congenital heart defects. Now, this is your defects right here. Now, I just discussed about increased pulmonary blood flow because the shunting in an ASD, VSD, it's gonna go from the left side because that's higher pressure. You have four pulmonary veins putting blood into that left atrium. And that left ventricle is that muscle. So it's squirting blood over there, okay? And then it goes back up into the lungs through the pulmonary artery. Another thing that children have is fetal circulation and it's called patent ductus arteriosus, which they are born with. This is a connection and you need to know this. It's a connection between the pulmonary artery and the aorta. So it connects systemic circulation to pulmonary oxygenation, okay? It is there at birth. How does it stay open right after birth? Well, there is a um, hormone called prostaglandin that is naturally produced and it keeps that little opening there. Sometimes we need to keep it there. That's why we're going to give synthetic prostaglandins to ensure to keep it open. Okay. So usually these close, usually after up to 21 days, usually about two, three days are gone. When they're open, you can hear a little murmur because it's an extra connection there that you hear. Once that PDA, that patent ductus arteriosus closes, the murmur disappears. Now, why would you need to keep that open? Well, what if, if you go way over the other side, you see transposition of the great arteries. You have the aorta connected to the pulmonary valve and you have the pulmonary valve connected to where the aorta is, which means what is going to the body and what's going to the lungs. They're not mixing. You're not getting blood going to the body that's oxygenated. How can we do that? Well, didn't I just say it's a connection between systemic and pulmonary blood flow? It allows mixing and it does a great job. Now, that's a life-saving device. If we let it close, there's no oxygenation. Child's going to die. So how do we keep it open? It's on the list. It's prostaglandin. It's kept there to promote cardiac output and oxygenation on infants with tr transposition of the great arteries until surgery. And the best thing about that is these little infants can wait for a week 
before they have surgery. They can eat a bottle. Mom can bond with them. It is a scheduled surgery and not an emergency rush, which is better for the child and everybody. It's planned. Now, we've already talked about an obstruction called coarctation of the aorta. Remember, everything goes backward. Now, there's two words you need to remember, stenosis and atresia. A means absent, without. Atresia, there's nothing there. When you see that, it's usually the valve, tricuspid valve. Usually, it's not there. That's right-sided. There's nothing there. That means blood can't go from the right atrium to the right ventricle, which can't go to the lungs again, okay? It's another big, big surgery on this child. Stenosis is a narrowing, and we can open those sometimes just through cardiac cath as an interventional procedure. Go in, put a balloon, stretch them, and they can work. Sometimes it works. Sometimes we have to go in, replace valves or repair them, but Stenosis is a narrowing, like coarctation, a narrowing. Atresia, there is nothing. So decreased pulmonary blood flow is the tricuspid atresia. There's no blood going from the right atrium to the uh, lungs because there's no opening there at all. So there's no blood flow, okay? The other thing is, and this is the one that NCLEX loves, it's called Tetralogy of Fallot. Ever hear of a tet spell before? A tet spell is when all of a sudden the pulmonary artery closes or a piece of skin tissue covers it and no blood flow is allowed up into the lungs. My little baby Nathan had a tet spell on me at three o'clock one morning, went from a SATS of 100% to 10 in 15 seconds. And what do you do for that? Well, you have an infant with tetralogy who goes cyanotic. You take their knees and forcefully push them to the chest. And what does it do? There is chest pressure and abdominal cavity pressure. And when you push it, it changes the pressure and it allows whatever covering the pulmonary artery and it lets blood flow back up there. These are surgically repaired and they're done at all different times. Some at birth, some later, some, you know, when they're toddlers, it all depends on what's going on with them. Those older children who have Tetralogy of Fallot, who have a tet spell without even knowing, they squat. And it does the same thing like knee chest, doesn't it? Think about you squatting on the floor, your feet are on the floor and you just sit down on your feet. That is a knee chest and that will open it up. So that's tetralogy. It is a most common cyanotic heart disease. It has four components to it. It has pulmonary atresia. Now, because that flap goes over and blood's still coming in, that right ventricle stretches, so right ventricular hypertrophy. Most of the time there is a connection between the left and right uh, ventricle called a VSD, ventricular septal defect. And sometimes the aorta pushes over, like it's called an overriding aorta. Four components, all right-sided stuff. You think tetralogy, think of the right side of the heart. That's why you need to go and review the heart. Now, the mixed blood flow, I've already talked about transposition and how to treat it. It's literally just the main arteries are switched. And because they're switched, the systemic and oxygenation don't connect. And we keep it connected with this patent ductus arteriosus. Sometimes it's not enough. And sometimes we can take that patent foramen ovale, put a catheter through it, make a balloon, and literally tear a hole into that septum creating more right to left combination. So you can get oxygenated, unoxygenated blood where you need it to go. Um, another thing when we do surgery is called an arterial switch surgery. Makes sense, right? It's both arteries switching, pulmonary artery and aorta, both switched. And literally they pick it up, turn around and put it back down. It's literally how they're done. And these children do very, very well because now they're fully oxygenated, their hearts are pumping fine and they do well. 
The hardest diagnosis, as I said, is your hypoplastic heart. Um, hypoplastic left heart, most complicated type of heart that you can have. Many of these children do end up with transplant. Um, it is three-stage surgery, multiple cardiac calves, hospitalizations on medications, followed up with you know, cardiac you know, monthly, every two months. It is a real difficult thing. These children, if they can get after three stages of surgery, over 90% oxygen saturations, they're doing good. These are the children you'll see the clubbing of the fingers. So there's a couple more little things about it. And it shows you some things. I left the pictures here for you, but let's go down now to congestive heart failure. Well, we mentioned coarctation of the aorta because of backward flow, blood's going up into the lungs, filling it up, making that left ventricle stretch, it's getting weak. And there's this, all this extra fluid on the infant. What are you going to see in an infant in congestive heart failure? Well, just like that one that had that coarctation, we're gonna see them tachypnic, tachycardic. They're gonna be retracting. They're gonna tire easily. They're gonna have low weights, failure to thrive um, because all of this work of the heart, it's burning calories and now it's filling up with fluid and they can't breathe and they can't oxygenate. So what do we look for with these children? Well. Their whole lungs are going to be filled up with fluids. It's just part of what happens and it keeps going until we correct it. How do we correct these things? Well, we need to improve cardiac function. Well, how can you improve it with all of these fluids? Well, you're going to give some sort of diuretic, furosemide. All the meds you give to an adult, we give to children. There's no special pediatric drugs. We give them milligrams per kilogram, micrograms per kilogram, same thing as adults, digoxin. Um, we give you know, dopamine, dibutamine, all those things we still give to children. So how are we gonna manage congestive heart failure? Well, we need to number one, monitor intake and output. We're gonna be giving diuretics. We're gonna give that heart something to help it work better. It, whether it's a digoxin or other medications, milnarone, Promacor, something to help the little dopamine, little things to help that heart work. So remember it's stretched, it's tired. It needs to build up its muscles again. We're gonna be giving those diuretics. So we need to monitor intake and output extremely carefully. Daily weights are so important. In fact, as this child gets better, we need to make sure they don't go backwards again. So how do we know that? Well, if we see the kids starting getting tachypnic, tachycardic, decreasing their urine output means they are holding on to it, okay? Because parents don't always have scales at home. Some of them buy them because they want to be that meticulous. And I'm like, don't drive yourself nuts. If you're not seeing wet diapers, you know, you can see it, you know tell the doctor and he probably say either come in or depending on them, you know, give an extra dose of a diuretic to help them. And when we do those things, the cardiac feels better. You now have decreased fluid in the lungs and now we can oxygenate a lot better. During this time, could we put them on some oxygen? For sure. Whenever you have a child who's not breathing right, we put oxygen on just to help them uh, breathe easier, not to liquefy secretions or any of those things. It's to help them oxygenate so that they can rest. So improve your cardiac function, decrease those cardiac demands, make sure that respiratory distress is improved. And all that time, we're making sure they're getting nutrition, nutrition, nutrition. Because remember, no nutrition, their cognition, their mental status, it's not going to grow with them. Many times in severe congestive heart failure, these children will be placed on some sort of tube feeding. So they don't have to suck, swallow and breathe because they can't, okay? But they're still getting the nutrition that they do need. So it's very important that we do do those things. And then of course, everything to get that fluid out and that poor mother watching their child breathing, huffing and puffing with a tube in, you know, oh, my baby, and I can't even feed it. Remember, nutritive sucking when they're on a tube feeding promotes 
normal, healthy growth. And that child feels like they're eating if they're sucking, you know, a pacifier. This is those clubbing fingers I taught you about. This is probably a hypoplastic child who's a little bit older, probably about 10 years old there or more. Hypoxemia, as I said, is a very common thing to do with um, children with uh, severe uh, congenital heart defect, like your hypoplastic right and left lungs. Their O2 saturations are never normal. Now, the body doesn't know it's normal. And it says, you know, I'm going to produce more red blood cells to carry oxygen around, right? That's what the heart does. The body says, all right, you need more cells. Well, what does that cause? It causes something called polycythemia, which means too many red blood cells. So what does that mean? Well, a normal H and H for an infant could be 14 and 42. A cardiac congenital heart defect, who's the hypoplastic cyanotic heart, could be 18 and 54, 19 and 57. It's crazy. You'll see these hemoglobin hematocrits really high, really thick blood, really. Um, sometimes it's so high that, you know, we take blood off of them because it's just too much on them. When you look at a child who is not having enough oxygen, you're gonna see them, you know, their color's not gonna be pink, you know, their lips, their tongue, their ears, you know, their fingers. You can tell that these children's O2 saturations are lower. And if these children are living with this condition, you see the clubbing right there. So at admission, newborn, coming in, congenital heart defect, you need to be there for that family. That mother just had a baby. She is hormonal. She is tearful. I did something wrong. They did nothing wrong. And I make sure that they're clear. It wasn't a glass of wine or the towel you had when you were early in your pregnancy. This is just something that happens. You did nothing wrong because they blame themselves. Mothers blame themselves. So I make sure they're aware of that because, and I stress that almost every visit. Tell the parent what you suspect, have them know the process, what's going on, what to expect, so they can plan their lives because they have an infant who now needs severe medical treatment. And they're gonna be many of them going through surgery pretty quickly. So help them understand what's going on. Get them prepared as this goes on. Um, because they're gonna go in home with this child. They have to take care of them. Why are you monitoring their diapers? What are you looking for? What could happen? What's their normal respiratory rate? What is retractions? What do you see? What is bad? Nasal flaring, talk about. Grunting, talk about. When they know those things, these children can seek uh, medical care before it becomes a big problem. So teaching is important and supporting these, these families because these children require a lot of care. And postoperatively, these children have tubes out of everywhere. They've got a chest, you know, incision. They've got chest tubes. They've got endotracheal tube. They've got IVs everywhere, Foley catheters, and it doesn't look like their baby anymore. I will give them a brush and say, could you comb their hair for me? How would you like it? Or the little girl I used to bring ribbons in and tie bows around their hair. What color would you like her to have today? And it makes it look like a baby. At least that little girl, that little blue bow on. And I used to do a lot of little things like that. Signs with their names with butterflies on them. Things that make it look almost homish as much as you can within the hospital because these poor parents, they still need to bond, don't they? They still need to touch their baby and not be afraid. I will even have them help me change diapers and wipe their butts with me standing right there and letting them know you can't hurt this child. Infants are the strongest human on earth, infants. And you think they're the weakest. They're unbelievable. That's why I love kids. Another thing you might see is endocarditis. And endocarditis is just like adults. There's absolutely no difference with this. This is when the um, lining of the heart gets an infection and you need to do your prophylaxis before any treatment's going on. Rheumatic fever is one of two conditions that can occur due to an under or not treated strep pharyngitis. It is a strep infection in the body that has gone untreated. And the way that 
rheumatic fever happens, it attacks the heart, attacks the joints. And usually these children come in uh, to the physician complaining of their knees hurting, their joints hurting, um, and just really tired. You might see them to the point where their gait is called chorea, where they can't walk and they fall over. And they're like, something's wrong with my child. Sometimes there's a, a rash on these children also, this big erythema uh, rash on them. And these children have a strep infection that wasn't treated. So first question, has your child been sick lately? Sore throat? Oh yeah, about three weeks ago, they had a sore throat. And you're like, okay, rheumatic fever. So how do we treat rheumatic fever? I said, it's a strep infection. So we are going to be given a long course of antibiotics and everything goes back to normal. Even that chorea and that, you know, unequal gait and the falling over, everything comes back when treated with the antibiotic long-term, four weeks, six weeks, depending on the child. Children get high cholesterols. We are now testing them for cholesterol. We didn't do that years ago. We do now. Of course, with any compliance with cholesterol is taking their medicine and even following a diet, which, you know, with children, it's harder to follow a diet because they want to eat what they want, what the other kids are eating, et cetera. Another thing is cardiac dysrhythmias. They kind of slow to fast to irregular um, arrhythmias. I've already mentioned the tachy dysrhythmias due to that right atrium. Um, and we treat them with the meds, just like we do with adults. I've seen pacemakers in young children, about a year old. They're tinier. But can you imagine those wires and pacemaker have to be changed more frequently as they get bigger and taller? Because they grow. Pulmonary artery hypertension is when the lungs um, can't exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide and they're tight. And you would see a child who under minimal exertion gets tired and dyspneic with chest pain. These children are placed on medications, sometimes continuous IV infusions until they can get a lung transplant. That's usually what they need when they get to the point of pulmonary artery hypertension. Could be due to a cardiac problem or not, um, or combination. Cardiomyopathy, I sort of mentioned it. It's the big floppy heart that has minimal cardiac output, is barely doing its job. Um, it could be due to familiar. It could be due to that infection. As I said, usually it's viral. It could be due to some sort of metabolic deficiency. Again, um, they don't all know, know what all it is, but it's the heart don't work. Now, when it gets to the point where it needs constant medications to help it work the best it can, they're going to go for transplant. Now, transplant is actually a pretty great thing. I've seen hypoplastic left hearts get a transplant and then have many years of quality life. In fact, every Valentine's Day, I don't think about my love. I think about little Thomas, who is a hypoplastic left heart, who on Valentine's Day, 10 years ago, got his heart and he's doing well. And him and his three brothers are having a great life. And I follow them actually on Facebook. And it's nice to see that this kid is living a relatively normal life. Now, it doesn't mean the transplant lives forever. I just had a girl last year, another hypoplastic left heart, little Olivia that I took care of, who was, uh, had the first heart started to fail. She went in for a second and it failed. Now, the mother sent me a personal email to tell me how my, what I've done many years ago. Now she was 22 when she died. I took care of as a newborn. She sent me an email to let me know that, you know, the way I did things, um, she uh, taught nurses as they came uh, these methods, how to take care of them. And she appreciated me. And she just wanted to let me know that Olivia led an extremely beautiful life and to thank me for everything I did and supported her and her whole family as that child was an, an infant. And I'll remember her forever. Biggest thing with heart transplant, 
rejection, rejection. Remember, they are placed on immunosuppressive drugs to prevent infection. So it's not infection, it's rejection. And we never used to treat the young kids and we never used to take their blood pressures before, but we're finding kids very young with hypertension. And the sooner we treat it, the more we can help those kidneys not fail because we know hypertension, one of the big things that occurs of undertreated hypertension is kidney failure. So we're starting to check blood pressures earlier. That's why I say, calm the kid down, show what's going on, you know, have them relax, get an accurate blood pressure so that literally you could be saving a kid's life. Kawasaki disease is a viral infection. Um, we bring it up in the cardiac world because it's a systemic vasculitis and we're worried about it attacking the coronary arteries. It's an inflammation which can cause an aneurysm in the coronary arteries of the heart. And if there's an aneurysm, that aneurysm could blow and the kid could die because that's where all your blood is, right? So what do you see? Now, this child has that fine red rash, not like the erythema big one, okay? This is that fine little rash. The one thing you see with Kawasaki is a progression. Um, very similar to your, um, your mononu mononucleosis. Kid's sick, something's going on, has a fever, nonspecific sort of complaints. It's been seven days on antibiotics, nothing's happened. And now the kid's, you know, eyes are turning red and they go to the ER, you know, we don't know what's happening, please help us. And I look at the kid, I see those red eyes, I see a little rash, they open their mouth, they've got a strawberry tongue, even their lips look like that. And then I start to see a little blistering or a peeling of the palms and the soles of the feet. The treatment for Kawasaki is aspirin. The only time we give aspirin. So why aspirin? Well, aspirin prevents clots and it's an anti-inflammatory. So it's mostly, they say it's for the clots because we want blood to flow. We don't want clots to pulmonary edema, cerebral clots, et cetera. We don't want that to happen to these children. And the other part is one month, and this is a one month treatment about, um, but we give intravenous immunoglobins for a one month. And once they're cured, they're fine. Now, as I said, our biggest concern is a coronary artery aneurysm. Once we diagnose a child with Kawasaki, we will be getting an echocardiogram pretty quick to look at that heart to make sure that coronary arteries are okay, all right? Shock, what are you gonna see? Decreased blood pressure, elevated heart rate, nothing you do is bringing it up. There's all different types of it. And shock, um, most of the time in children is due to sepsis. Some sort of infections overwhelm them. So let's talk about that ductus arteriosus. Remember the PDA connects what? The pulmonary artery to the aorta. So if we did a surgical closure of a PDA, that means we've clipped it, okay? What would you see? What does that do? Remember that left ventricle pumps hard and it pushes blood through the aorta, okay? So it goes by that PDA. So it forces blood back up into the lungs, right? So it mm -hmm. prevents the return <coughs> of oxygenated blood to the lungs. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Now, we don't always do a surgical closure. We can do a medical or medicine. And the medicine we use is called indomethacin. It's also on your list. If we have an open PDA and we don't need it, all it's doing is causing the heart to work harder. So you're burning calories. We see this a lot in your premature infants. We don't want them to burn calories. We want them to get big and buffy, right? So we give indomethacin 
it is actually an NSAID, believe it or not, but it's intravenous and we give up to three doses on it. And most of the time it's a three course thing. Doesn't work, we'll try three times. Then after that, we're gonna do surgical closure. What would you see after that PDA has closed? Let's say we did the medical treatment. You would see two things. No, number one, the murmur would be gone. That little swishing between the aorta and the pulmonary arteries, that'll disappear. So murmur disappears. Number two, what you see with the PDA is there's a wide pulse pressure. And what does that mean? Well, usually an infant, newborn, has a 60 over 40 blood pressure. It's a perfect blood pressure for a new newborn. When their PDA is open, it'd be 60 over 18. Wide pulse pressure. Once it closes, the bottom number will come back up to 40 where it should be, okay? So you'll see it without even knowing it or doing an echo because you can tell by assessment, okay? A lot of stuff, huh? Told you. A lot, a lot of stuff. It's very complicated. You're not gonna learn it in one round. You're gonna have to do it again, you know, and um, try to figure it out. What I suggest, if you can't, you don't understand, please do me a favor, ask me and I'll help you, okay? All right, let's do our cahoots. Anybody want to win today? Brittany, you're going to win for me today? Maybe. Oh, let's try it anyway. It will be a couple minutes over today. If you have to leave, get your children. Just listen to the recording so that you get all of it because there is some extra information on the cahoots. I cannot say everything in the slides, what's going on. So this cahoots is all that other stuff that you do need. <clears throat> Anybody who still wants to go over the first exam, please let me know. What I'm finding is mostly it's understanding the theorists, believe it or not, and how to talk to adolescents. Those are the two things that I am seeing mostly on the exam. All right, let's get going. Oh, mouth is back. <laughs> A majority of upper respiratory infections are caused by what? <clears throat> so mostly viruses. Remember upper respiratories, you're gonna to go to the doctor, they're gonna say Tylenol, Motrin, liquids, and it still continues, then you go back. But usually it's just a virus. A multi-select. What would you suspect if a child has a dry, bothersome cough that keeps them awake at night? Now, remember when we're describing the cough, it's a dry, bothersome cough. So you know it's not croup, okay? What it is, is an inflammation of the bronchus. And you know, what you could see is that it is going to actually, it's just bronchitis to tell you the truth. It is not croup. I, how did that get to be a multiple one? Um, Cause I had changed it. So dry bothersome cough, mostly at night. It's an irritation. If you've ever had bronchitis, you know, your, your complaint is I just can't sleep. I just want to sleep. And um, that is bronchitis. Croup is a barking, barking cough. The preventative immunization for RSV is what? And I've also put, you know, the generic and the um, brand name there.
but it is center just absolutely good job. All of the following are signs of early respiratory distress, except, remember I tell you, respiratory distress, you're gonna see tachypnea, tachycardic, you're gonna see restlessness, you're going to see some hypoxemia, you're gonna see retractions, supraclavicular retractions, flaring of the nose, grunting. Late signs is bradycardia, okay? If you can't breathe and you're restless, you're working hard, you're going to become diaphoretic, whether you're an adult or whether you're a child, okay? A four-year-old child has been taking meds for asthma. The child is still wheezing. What information is important? What are you going to ask that parent? So this is the one that they're still wheezing, they're four-year-old, they're taking the little MDI and they're not getting the medicine. So teaching them how to use a spacer would be important. We can use spacers on young kids a year old. An eight-month-old with croup exhibits signs and symptoms of respiratory distress of what? What would you see? Croup. Tracheolaryngeal bronchitis. So you're going to be seeing retractions and then you're going to see respiratory distress, restlessness. That is showing you O2 saturations are going down. Abdominal breathing, pulse of 140, that's sort of the beginning. But when respiratory distress, you'll see those retractions. That's the word there, retractions. Signs and symptoms of asthma include all except... you will definitely have a cough. Those bronchioles are coming together. They're touching, they're coughing and coughing and coughing and they can't catch their breath and they're wheezing like crazy. It's a prolonged expiratory phase that you see on them. They get air in, but they can't get it out. Signs and symptoms of congenital heart disease include all except mentioned it a couple times. So remember, congenital heart disease, the heart's working really fast, really hard to get the poor child oxygenated. So weight gain will be not well at all. It'll not be appropriate. These children will be small. And part of it is poor feeding because they tire easily due to tachypnea and tachycardia. What would you not do to children diagnosed with croup and epiglottitis? Inflammation of the upper airway. What aren't you going to do? You're not going to look at that inside there unless you're the person who can intubate or put a trach in because you're going to cause some more inflammation there and you do not want to do that. Epiglottis is what? What is an epiglottis? What does that do? It's everything. It's that leaf-like piece of cartilage that covers the larynx when you swallow to prevent choking. So you can eat without it being aspirated. 
multi-select. When doing an admission of an infant with a low grade fever and loose cough, what information is important to gather on this infant? You're doing your nursing history on this child. I mean, you want your allergies, you want to know immunizations, their fever. When did they last have Tylenol or Motrin, depending on the child's age? You know, APGARs at birth really don't make a difference right now. It's something the physician will gather, but we need to take care of this child, this infant right now. Regina's on fire. What is cystic fibrosis? Cystic fibrosis is a congenital um, defect that's caused from um, mother and father give it to you, um, more males than females. And this is when the body cannot take care of different foods and the lungs and the GI system just collects and clogs with mucus. The lungs become like these thick Petri dishes. So the lungs need aggressive, aggressive chest respiratory uh, physical therapy, um, deep breathing, coughing, exercising, um, aerosols, et cetera, to keep it moving. And then the GI system can't digest foods. So you need to be giving um, something called pancreatase with meals. It needs to, it's a capsule. You can sprinkle it on the food, but remember to rinse their mouth when they're done. And with any medications with pediatric, with pediatric children with medicine, medicines that are for life, make sure as they get older, they get a bigger dose, okay? But their lungs is a big, big thing. What is the greatest risk for an infant having a cardiac catheterization? Any child going for a cardiac cath, your biggest worry is the hemorrhage, okay? Um, all the other stuff here, it's, you know, some is expected like decreased pulses, cardiac dysrhythmias, some of them are expected, but the big thing is they'll bleed out so quickly. First thing you need to do is check that dressing and try to keep that leg straight as possible. How is cystic fibrosis identified? I mean, if the mother had it or the father, or you have another child who has it, you know, they're going to be tested for sure. Sometimes it's just that infant at birth um, is, doesn't have a stool within two or three days. It's one of the things they check for. And how do they check that? And it's, they do this something called a sweat test. Literally, if you took and licked a child with cystic fibrosis, you would taste salt. That's why you have no salt restrictions on these children. Children with cystic fibrosis need higher calories, they need higher protein, and they do not restrict the salt on them. A multi-select. What is included in the plan of care for a child with cystic fibrosis? got to take care of their lungs. You got to give them the pancreas taste and you've got to give them high protein. I just said they're having salt coming out in their sweat. No salt restriction. They can have salt. What is the drug of choice for pharmacological closure of that patent ductus arteriosus? And that's the indomethacin, okay? Something you need to remember. What does indomethacin do? 
it blocks the production of the body's own prostaglandins. No prostaglandins, the duct closes. And that's what indomethacin does. An LP on fire. What is not a feature of Tetralogy of Fallot? Remember, Tetralogy of Fallot is all right sided. So aortic stenosis is on your left side. Actually, pulmonary artery stenosis is number one. That's what happens. The pulmonary artery gets occluded. No blood goes to the lungs. Remember, O2 saturations go from 100 to 10 in about 15 seconds. It's scary. They go from pink to black. It's, it's insane what you see with those children with tet spells. What medication would hold you hold for an infant that is vomiting with vital signs? 98, pulse 88 respiratory rate 32. If they were on any of these medicines, would you say, no, I'm not gonna give that. Remember one of the signs of ditch toxicity is nausea and vomiting. Of course, those yellow spots, but an infant can't tell you that, okay? And then of course, a decreased heart rate. You're gonna hold it, tell the doc, and you're gonna do a digoxin level. All they can show you is heart rate and vomiting. So that is what you look for, for ditch toxicity in an infant, because they can't tell you how they feel. Why would a child with tetralogy of flow not gain weight at the normal rate? Remember, Tetralogy of Fallot is a cyanotic heart condition. So it's that inadequate oxygenation leads to decreased energy to feed. It's to think, what is Tetralogy? What do I know about it? It's the most common cyanotic heart defect. All examples are of cyanotic heart murmurs except which one? And it's not truncus. I need to take that one off of there. Which one is not cyanotic? Remember to know those words, stenosis and atresia, what does that mean? Aortic stenosis is on the left side. So it has nothing to do with oxygenation and it still allows blood to go to the body. Remember atresia is no opening between the right atrium and right ventricle. How is blood gonna go through the pulmonary artery up into the lungs? It can't. So it absolutely is this one of those um, defects that is cyanotic. What is the most common cyanotic congenital heart defect? Most common congenital heart defect, it's cyanotic, I've said it, tetralogy of Fallot. PDA promotes oxygenation, okay? And hypoplastic left heart is a horrible condition and thank God it's not the most common. Nursing care following the cardiac catheterization. So first thing, you're gonna check that dressing. You're not gonna put the head of the bed up too quick. You're not gonna elevate that extremity and absolutely bed rest, no ambulation for those older children. 
Nursing education for cardiac catheterization include all except. We're not gonna bend that knee, right? We are going to tell them about the pressure dressing. They need to know something tight's gonna be there and why, or even if the sandbag has to be there on some of the uh, bigger kids, we're gonna tell them for sure. They need to understand. Which information is the most important when rheumatic fever is suspected? So you're seeing all the signs, you're gonna see the, the joints, you're gonna see the fever, you're gonna see, you know, falling and tripping and, you know, not walking well. First thing you're gonna ask, have you had a sore throat recently? And it's usually within two to three weeks and you start seeing these signs and symptoms because what does rheumatic fever do when it's not treated? It's gonna cause valve, um, destroy valves. And usually it's the mitral valve that it likes to destroy. And then you need open heart valve surgery. Signs of shock in children include all of the following, except What do you see in shock? Elevated heart rate, decreased blood pressure, poor capillary refill, decreased urinary output, altered mental status, hypertension, no. You see opposite, opposite. What is the treatment for Kawasaki disease? Remember, Kawasaki disease is systemic vasculitis. It means it affects the vessels, blood vessels within the body. And the most thing we're concerned about is the coronary arteries and aneurysms. Once we determine Kawasaki, how do we treat it? Aspirin to prevent clots and IVIG, to, which is um, intravenous immunoglobins to boost the immune system because it is a viral disease. Which of the following best describes the pathophysiology of Kawasaki disease? Multi-system vasculitis, we're mostly concerned about the coronary arteries. So once we know we have Kawasaki, what are we gonna do as soon as we can? Echocardiogram, we wanna look at those coronary arteries. A multi-select. A clinical manifestation of Kawasaki disease is what? What would you see? You see the blistered, cracked, or cracked sort of skin on the palms and the soles, eyes glow in the dark red, strawberry tongue, and you're not going to see an erythema marginum. That's only in your um, rheumatic fever, okay? You're going to see that fine little rash in Kawasaki. Those are the differences of rashes in those two diseases. Why is an echocardiogram needed for the patient with Kawasaki? And of course, we want to find out about the coronary arteries. It could have aneurysms, they could blow, and they need to, we need to go in and fix them immediately. MJ on fire. 
Which of the following is the most common cause of shock in infants and children? And it's infection. Infection is the most common cause for it. Children get infections and because they haven't had them before, many of them, they get very sick. What are the defects associated with tetralogy of Fallot? Remember again, tetralogy, where is it? It's on the right side. So what would you see? So pulmonary stenosis, pulmonary artery, that VSD, that aorta sort of pushing over, misplaced or overriding. And when your blood can't go up into the lungs, it's going to stretch that right ventricle, which is hypertrophy or stretching of the ventricle. A young child with tetralogy of Fallot may assume which position naturally when having a tet spell? Your older child, what do they do? Infants, what do we do? Need a chest, right? We do it for them. But a child walking around, they squat to the floor. They're on their feet and they straight to the floor and it changes pressures in their abdominal and chest cavity and it stops the tet spell. Transposition of the great arteries is what? What are the great arteries of the heart? And it is the positions of the pulmonary artery and aorta are switched. The heart on the opposite side is called dextrocardia, which is something completely different. I don't even get in for you, but I just let you know. Which of the following is not an intervention indicated for transposition of great arteries? So remember, you have pulmonary blood, oxygenated, systemic blood, not oxygenated, and they aren't mixing. How do you get oxygen to the body? You want your prostaglandins. And then sometimes, as I said, you take that patent foraminal valley and make it and punch a hole in it to make more flow between right and left side. And then the surgery that is done is picking it up, turning around, and putting it on called an arterial switch operation. Oral nothing will work on these children. And I have no idea what oral vasodilators would do for this child. It's not going to give oxygen to them. A multi-select. Why is prostaglandins given to a child with transposition of the great arteries? What is prostaglandins? I heard about that somewhere today. <laughs> it helps with keeping the heart pumping and it provides that oxygenation that they need. It connects the pulmonary artery to the aorta and allows oxygenation to go on. And it really buys time for these children to have surgery. It has nothing to do with antibiotics or endocarditis, it has nothing to do with that. Only oxygen and cardiac output, period. What is the purpose of giving endomethacin to a neonate with a patent ductus arteriosus? What does endomethacin do? What do you know about a PDA? Uh -oh. We know that the endomethacin 
is given to stop the body's own prostaglandins for keeping that duct open because that's how it stays open, okay? So it blocks it. And we close it up because the child doesn't need it. How do we know that duct is closed? Murmur's gone, right? And the pulse pressure now is not so wide, it comes back to normal. Blood pressure, back to normal. Where is the patent ductus arteriosus? What does it connect? It connects the aorta to the pulmonary artery. Make sure you study this. PDA is an important thing in the cardiac, you know, chapter. This heart defects allows blood to pass from the left ventricle to the right ventricle. What if it was the right atrium to the right ventricle, right, left atrium, right atrium, left atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle, what are those things? What holes, what are they called? It's called a ventricular septal defect between the ventricles and atrial septal defect between the atrium. A multi-select. What is a sign of ditch toxicity in infants? What are you gonna see? What are you gonna look for? Well, they can't tell you there's yellow spots in front of their eyes, it's an infant, but you will see like maybe retching, which is nausea, and of course vomiting, and of course a decreased heart rate. Those things you'll see. Spots, they can't tell you. Multi-select. Where can the blood go when the PDA closes? Well, what does it connect? What does that mean? So when the PDA closes, it stays in the lungs or it stays in the body. Um, remember, PDA connects the pulmonary artery to the aorta. So pulmonary artery is lungs, aorta is body. I hope you're starting to understand. What is congestive failure? Congestive heart failure, what does that mean? You know, when you talk about congestive heart failure, if it's just due to a weak heart, Children and adults, basically, you're going to do the same thing. Um, it's just the way that you manage and what you look for. But congestive heart failure is when the heart is weak. It can't pump properly. And then fluid builds up in the lungs. And we can see it starting to occur when we see tachypnea, tachycardia, decreased urine output. You're going to see those things. So we monitor fluid intake, output and we are gonna be monitoring um, their daily weights. How do you measure urinary output in an infant? Well, we have a diaper, size one is 30 grams. If we take a wet diaper off an infant and it weighed 60 grams, urinary output is 30 because one gram equals one ml of urine output, okay? And that's how you measure output. So we're not gonna have Foley catheters in infants, we don't need them. We can just measure their diapers. Left-sided congestive heart failure causes what? When the left side of the heart's not working, garden hose, where do you see it land? <clears throat> And this is when you see all of those 
respiratory thing, shortness of breath, fluid in the lungs, coughing because it's filling up the lungs, left-sided. And that's usually what congestive failure is, left-sided. A multi-select. Signs and symptoms of rheumatic fever include, there's a beautiful picture here also. So erythema marginatum, which means that big rash, the chorea, which is the gate, those swollen um, uh, joints and nodules over the joints. And once it's treated with a month or two of antibiotics, because it's untreated and undertreated or not treated strep infection, all of these things do go away and the child can go back to normal as long as those valves of the heart have not been affected. After a heart transplant, what is the leading reason children die? You know, when you talk about any transplant, the leading reason is rejection. So it's not infection, it's rejection. And a multi-select. A child's about to have a chest tube removed. What should you do? You know, taking out a chest tube, they could be in the chest, being in the lungs. You know, you pull them out and I'm telling you, they burn and they hurt really, really bad. So what are we gonna do for this child? So we'll explain it. We will have that child sitting up. We don't want them laying down because we want them to breathe easier. But most of all, most of all, medicate them for pain. This hurts, it burns, adults cry it hurts so bad. Make sure they're medicated. A child just had abdominal surgery, chest surgery, cannot cough well enough to expectorate secretions. What is your priority as a nurse? You know, any surgery postoperatively, our nursing care is to prevent complications, whether it's clots, you know, circulation or preventing the lungs from collapsing. So we need them to cough and deep breathe. How are we gonna have them do that? Number one, give them something for pain. Then they can be moved, get out of bed, do incentive spirometry. If you don't give them incentive spirometry, if you don't give them pain medicine, they're not going to blow well, okay? So make sure first you medicate for pain. Most important priority there. An infant of three months has a fever of 1036. What would you medicate the infant with? Up to six months old, only acetaminophen or Tylenol. After six months old, you can introduce ibuprofen. There's something with platelet aggregation and clotting with um, Motrin ibuprofen in children younger than that. So only Tylenol up till six months old, every four to six hours. A newborn infant's assessed and you find very weak lower extremities. What should you do and assess next to give this physician information? What are you gonna do next? Very weak lower extremity pulses, newborn, just out of the mother. What are you suspecting? Well, I'm gonna suspect coarctation of the aorta, right? So if we do extremity for extremity blood pressures, I'm gonna see the arms, higher blood pressures and the legs lower. So now the physician has the information they need and can now do an echocardiogram and do the treatment, which is surgery, multi-select. 
A critically ill child is on complete bed rest. What can a nurse do to prevent complications? You have children who just had open heart surgery and doesn't mean that children don't get decubitus ulcers, they can. Doesn't mean they don't get foot drop, they can. They get lung atelectasis, they get blood clots, just like adults. So we're gonna do the incentive spirometry. Children, we prop them with pillows and blankets and get them in good positions. Head of the bed's gonna be up. We're gonna turn them every two hours, not every six hours, making the lung on top, getting more expansion and keeping those lungs moving. So that's the only thing. Every two hours turning these children. Multi-select. How can oxygen be delivered that is easy as tolerated and accurately monitored for infants? You know, we give oxygen, you know, to prevent hypoxemia and it, you know, helps children breathe easier because, and, you know, it's the effort of breathing decreases. How is it done that they like it the best? And it's the most accurate. Well, oxy hood by far is the best. Little plastic hood, they can still put their fingers in their mouth, they can still have their pacifier. Nasal cannula, sometimes it bothers them, but still it's accurate and we can monitor it. They don't like endotracheal tubes and blow by is not accurate at all. So those things, no. But I like the oxy hoods the best. Multi-select. What procedure are used to keep the lungs open with a children with cystic fibrosis? Remember, mucus is filling up. It's like a Petri dish of mucus in these lungs. What are we gonna do? And this is not only when they're sick, this is every day. <clears throat> Deep breathing, chest PT, exercise, and ambulating, not PRN, several times a day, okay? So not PRN, it's the only difference with that answer. Multi-select. Children with cystic fibrosis require pancreatic enzymes with meals. What teaching are you gonna give these children and the parents? You're gonna see this on one of your questions of your NCLEX. You're gonna take the pancreatic enzymes right before the meals and not an hour or two before, right before. You can open it up and sprinkle it if they can't swallow it, but to rinse their mouth. And always, as they grow, they're gonna need a bigger dose, especially children with medicines that they're gonna be taking for a lifetime. What is a cardiac defect where there is no valve between the right atrium and right ventricle? Well, let's go back to just anatomy. What valve is between the right atrium and the right ventricle? And what does no valve mean? What is that word I told you? Tricuspid atresia, excellent, absolutely. That tricuspid valve, no valve is atresia. Stenosis is a little opening, it's the narrowing. Good job, you listened. What is the greatest factor for a newborn receiving a cardiac catheterization? I X'd it earlier. <clears throat> And we're worried about a hemorrhage, very good. And last question, guys. When an infant is breathing fast, tires easily and needs rest periods during feedings, what should you assess? What do you think is going on? They're breathing fast, they're tired easy, they need a lot of rest. What are you suspecting? What does that sound like to you? I think it sounds like congestive heart failure, doesn't it? Let's listen to those breath sounds and see if they're clear. If they're not, 
something's going on. You can sure listen to the heart rate, count the respirations, but listening is going to give you your best answer. All right, who's number three today? AR is number three. Number two, Mary J. Good job, Mary J. Number one, BCWS. And number four, LP and Regina. Good job, guys. A lot of information today. Please sign your attendance attestations to make sure that they're done. And do I have any questions at all from anybody? A lot of information today, a lot of stuff to cover. I think I repeated it, repeated it to try to push it through to you, keep explaining it. Again, if you don't understand it, please make an appointment with me. I'll go over it and try to re-explain it to you, okay? Thank you guys. Thanks for staying. I know it's long today. Usually not. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. You're absolutely welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a great Bye. day. You too.